speaker today. Okay, uh, so let's wait uh, uh, still a couple of minutes and then uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll go with the introduction. Yeah. <clears throat> morning, Stephen. Say good morning, lad. Okay, I guess we can start. So, so, <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. So, thank you very much for joining. And uh, this is our uh, ACN Hub uh, seminar uh, the week before Christmas. I'm sure you are looking at your Christmas tree or wherever you are in the office or in the house. So uh, we will uh, leave uh, the last uh, few minutes of this talk to just exchange uh, wishes. But for today, in the moment, let's welcome our last before Christmas uh, speaker. Uh, presented in this way, uh, he has some kind of uh, uh, almost uh, holistic <laughs> or holy, holy aura. But, uh, so Nicolas Doyon from the University of Laval. And uh, it is a pleasure to, to have him over to our seminar series. So <clears throat> Nicola uh, uh, completed his master's degree in applied mathematics uh, at the University of Montreal, uh, working on models of cardiac activity. And after his doctorate in uh, theoretical mathematics still at Laval University, he became uh, joined to the Servo Research Center. Servo, it's in this case an acronym, but uh, in French uh, is a formamentu of, uh, of a brain, right? And develop uh, there, since there's since he's there, develop a brain like mathematical models that uh, essentially focus uh, mostly but not exclusively on uh, some mechanisms beyond uh, pain and chronic pain and specifically with emphasis on chloride homeostasis. Uh, aside from that, Nicola is also a full professor at the University of Laval, and uh, he is keen, uh, besides biophysical modeling, also uh, in a research dealing with uh, analysis, uh, finite uh, element methods, and differential equation simulations in the brain tissue with emphasis on not only on chloride homeostasis but in general also on how uh, electrical uh, electromagnetic fields in the in the brain are modified as a result of chloride uh, fluxes and of course other ion structures uh, not only in the tissue in the extracellular matrix but also within the complex dendritic uh, trees of neurons, right? And he does this work uh, uh, with strong emphasis on the multidisciplinary perspective, uh, being involved with multiple collaborations with experimentalists. So <clears throat> today, uh, Nicola is going to talk about as uh, uh, so uh, is going to talk about uh, synaptic transmission uh, in and in nano columns of the brain, which is probably uh, a work representative of, of his interest in in this complex analysis of uh, uh, ionic homeostasis. And without any further ado, I just leave uh, the stage to Nicola, who is going to be. Uh, talking with us for the next uh, uh, 
45 hour. And after that, remember that uh, we have about 30 minutes of, of questions. So, <clears throat> uh, Nicola, if uh, usually we leave you just talk and uh, uh, I'll ask uh, probably uh, in a couple of times during the audience to post the questions on the chat so we don't interrupt you. And if there are like some compelling questions, at some point, uh, we'll ask you to pose and to address some questions. But for the rest, otherwise, please go ahead. And uh, uh, and uh, I well, ask the audience just to post the questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this uh, very, very kind introduction. It's, uh, wow, very nice. So uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is a recent work that, that we did with um, PhD student Charting Ling about uh, mathematical model of synaptic transmission and nanocolons. So um, what are we going to talk about? First of all, we're going to discuss why we want to build mathematical model of synapses. Maybe, maybe most of you here, you like mathematical models, but I some one day I heard a biologist said, oh, when you don't know what to say, when you don't have any argument, you show an equation. So I always hope to convince people that uh, equations are not that bad. And one first reason why we want to build a mathematical model of, of synapses or any neural structure is that we want to understand pathologies. Another reason is that we want to understand fundamental principles of, uh, let's say, computation, because the brain is kind of a computing machine. Then I'm going to briefly, briefly explain what are nanocolons. That's kind of a new things, not new in the sense that they probably always have existed, but they were relatively uh, recently discovered. Nicola, sorry to interrupt you. So yeah. we are only seeing the first slide, the opening slide. So if you could actually uh, how, 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 either go do? on the on the slide mode. Do, so do, we can... do, you, do, you, do you see them now? Yeah, I see. I see. However, it's just uh, uh, like the, the presenter view. So we only see your first slide and the slides on the on the right. So maybe you want to go on the Présenter uh, en ligne. Paramètres d'affichage, dupliqué, like this? Correct, exactement. Thanks a lot. Okay, yes. so, so thanks a lot. So, and then, I, 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 so uh, first we're going to talk about why to build models, then present rapidly what are monocolons, then I will talk a little bit more specifically of the work that we did with um, our PhD student, Shouting Lee. So this is just uh, to show that what we want to do, we want to take um, a snaps and translate it into equations. But why we want to do that? The first reason is that we want to, in some cases, better understand pathologies and hopefully uh, ways of treating them. What I, I, as Mauricio, as Mauricio said, what I've been working on a, a lot is neuropathic pain in um, in collaboration with Yves de Conant and and with Stephen who who's there. So, in when you have neuro, neuropathic pain, this is the the figure that we always show. The thing is. You have um, GABA, GABA object synapses, and glycine object synapses that play an important role in inhibition. And when you lose inhibition, then the signals get too, too strong, and you have neuropathic pain. And what, what we're trying to show here is that to have inhibitory current through GABA synapses, you must have an influx of chloride. So the inhibitory current comes from the fact that you have negative chloride ions entering the cells. But then 
this is symbolized by the, the pool. So when you have a lot of uh, chloride entering the, the cell, which is symbolized by the water entering the pool, then the pool gets full and the water doesn't get in anymore. So what we have, um, this has been done uh, with Steve, is that when you have no, um, no chloride extrusion, because uh, there's an important protein that's called KCC2, KCC2 which extrudes chlorides uh, thanks to the, the, the potas potassium gradient. And if you don't have it, well, chloride accumulates within the cell. And when you have repeated fi firing, you, you lose the inhibitory ca capacity of synapses. So that's what that's the, the, the baseline motivation of many of our of our model. And in uh, well in 20, 20, uh, 2020, uh, I collaborated just a small role, but I collaborated on a paper uh, done by the group of uh, Yves de Conin, who showed that if you target both the GABA synapses and the chloride extrusion together, you can, you can better treat neuropathic pain because a big problem when you try to treat neuropathic pain is that if you only target the um, chloride conductance or if you only increase the um, activity of inhibitory synapses, what you get is that the, the metaphorical pools, they get full of chloride and then it cannot get in. So what you see here is that uh, it's a um, model of neuropathic pain when you, you put a cough on a mice or a rat paw, and you see a, lo a loss of synapse here in PNI. The PNI stands for peripheral nerve injury. And this is uh, illustrated here. Here is illustrated that, that in PNI, you you the PNI does a cause a change in both the number of uh, synapse and of and the type of receptors. So what we shown through a, a bit of uh, mathematical equations is um, is that if you have two drugs, one that acts on the chloride conductance which is this one here, L838, and one that acts on chloride extrusion, that's a CLP257. That, that drug has been developed by the, the group of the Conite. You have a greater effect on restoring inhibition. It's more effective at restoring inhibition that acting on the um, any of the two part pathways separately. So you have kind of a synergistic effect. Um, that's what has been experimentally observed here. So the, the, you increase the maximal uh, possible analgesia by, combine, by combining um, CLP and a drug acting on uh, chloride channel. Here, it's um, in, in this paper. We through simulation we showed that if you acted on the same effector, meaning that if the the drug CLP that acts on chloride extrusion and the drug L838 acting on chloride conductance would act on the same effector, you will get only a small combined effect. But if you act on two different effectors, one on the conductance, one on the extrusion, then you'll get a larger uh, 
larger effect on restoring inhibition. And we have shown that um, the experiment, the experiments here, it, in the red, it's the experimental, the experimental data. It fits more the hypothesis that the two drugs act on two different effectors than on separate one. So here it's a nice story when the where the, the simulation fits the experiment. So that's a, um, a motivation for um, doing simulations. And another motivation that I want to talk uh, briefly on, uh, why do we want to build mathematical model of synapses? Uh, another reason is that we want to understand basic principle or fundamental computing principle of synaptic activity. Because again, as I said, one of the goal of the brain is to perform computation. And here in a, in a paper written jointly with uh, Stephen and Eve, uh, we showed that if we lose a little bit of um, chloride homeostasis in inhibitory synapses, even if it's not much, well, the synapses will lose their capacity to transmit information. So, and I just want to talk briefly uh, on uh, about uh, other study, uh, other studies that uh, have done fundamental um, that that have used uh, mathematical models of synapses to derive fundamental principle. This one is a uh, what I think is a nice work by Savchenko and Rusakov, who, who shown that may, maybe you, you do that or maybe not. Maybe you think it's a good idea or maybe not. One thing we can ask in neuroscience is the why question. Why are things the way they, they are? So, and one, I, one general hypothesis, which may or may not be true, is that the brain optimizes things. So here the Savchenko and Rusakov ask the question, why, why is the synapse the way it is? Or more precisely, what, why is the height of the synapse about 10 to 20 nanometers? Well, they show that if the synapse is too wide, what will happen if the synapse is too wide or, or too high? Then the receptors won't bind to the, 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 the neurotransmitters won't bind to the receptors because they will have low concentration. So the synapse should be narrow. But then what happens is if the synapse is too narrow or too, too thin? Well, you will have a great electric field, a, a very large electric field within the synapse. We'll come back to that later. And that will decrease the current. So they show here that the cleft width or the, the height of the synapse, if you, if you want, here it's the synapse, so the, the height here, for which the current is the largest possible is around like 10 nanometers. So, some people don't like this type of argument because it's uh, maybe circular because you show that what you observe is the optimal thing, but I think it's quite nice because it's uh, it's always, in my opinion, it's always nice to prove that the brain satisfies some, some logic or, or some uh, optimization principle. So here again, they, they showed that uh, the optimal height of the synapse depends on the, the effective diffusion coefficient and the radius of the synapse. And I just want to show very briefly that other works have been done that relate uh, synaptic modeling to uh, optimization principle. Um, there's a ni nice uh, paper by Varshney and, and I, I never know how to say it, Klovsky, who, who showed that the um, the distribution of the synaptic weights satisfies or roughly satisfies 
uh, a way to uh, maximize information storage. And then there's a classic one by Atwell and Laughlin, who showed that uh, synaptic signaling and um, re restoring synaptic activity account for a large proportion of the energy expense in the brain. So if one would, it's something that I, I would like to do, but I do not, I do not have the good I and I do not have a good idea of how to frame the problem. It would be to relate um, synaptic activity to uh, metabolism and how synaptic activity should optimize energy consumption. So something like that. So they show here that uh, synapse occur uh, synapse synapses explain more than a third of the brain energy budget, if you want. So let's get more precisely to, to the work that I want to talk uh, about. Recently, the, the, there, have been, there has been um, experimental work, not by a group, but um, very work that has been published in Nature and that, that has a big, um, big impact that has demonstrated the um, existence of nanocolons. What are monocolons? Here on the left, you, you see that the presynaptic, this, this is a, um, uh, in green, this is a marker that in, in, in indicate the locus of presynaptic vesicle docking. And uh, on the blue or purple, on the bottom, you see a marker indicating postsynaptic receptors. So you see that the, the docking site of vesicles is kind of aligned with postsynaptic receptors. And there are several hypotheses that can explain this, but it seems that nanocolons are um, correlated with the um, existence of uh, transsynaptic filaments. So like there will there, there, there seems to exist proteins that span the, the synaptic cleft that are like that. And for, uh, for us, for us who like to build model, mathematical models of things, we say, okay, if there are um, nanocolons, if there are uh, proteins that um, span the synaptic cleft, how do we model it? How does it uh, impact? How does it impact synaptic transmission? And there was a nice paper that was published in um, Biosystem by Francesco Ventriglia, and we missed it when we first wrote the, the first version of our papers and submitted it. We were told, "Oh, you you should look at this one," which is, uh, I don't know if it ever happened to you, you, you write a paper, you submit, and, and you missed uh, something in the li literature. So, and the thing that they, do, they did, they, well, it said in the title, they wanted to model the effect of filament. So that, that, that can characterize nanocolons on the synaptic response. And what they did is uh, in a sense, they had, more patients or more patients or how do I say? They were more meticulous than we, th th than we because they, they model each, each filament individually. You see each circle here, it's a, a filament and, and they model NMDR receptors and AMPA receptors and what they did uh, or what he did, it's a single author paper, is that he modeled the diffusion of neurotransmitters. You see in yellow, it's the neurotransmitters. And when you have dark, um, dark green, it's a transsynaptic filament. And you have to account for collisions between the two. So the neurotransmitters will bounce on the, on the filament. 
and he tried several configuration and he showed that this uh, the, the presence of such uh, of such cylindrical structure that uh, hinder diffusion will indeed have an impact on the synaptic current and of course, it will depend on the temperature. Why, why does it depend on the temperature? Because uh, temperature will affect diffusion in the same way that, uh, not in the same way, but the transsynaptic filament affect diffusion and temperature also affect diffusion. So the two are kind of linked. So this is a, this was a, a, a nice paper that we unfortunately uh, missed the first time, but uh, what we we tried our, our goal was a, a bit similar. We wanted to to see what would be the impact of nanocolon or how would they uh, modulate uh, synaptic signaling. So what we didn't do, we didn't consider each filament because. First of all, um, it's complicated, and I don't like to do uh, things that are difficult because you have to to specify in, in your code the, the position of a, a, every um, a, every filament, and you have to uh, compute the possibility of collision between each neurotransmitter and each filament. So. What we said instead is that we we have regular obstacles. The, the, the filaments, we can consider them as regular obstacles. And if you have uh, regular obstacles, what will happen? Well, it will decrease the effective diffusion coefficient. So we just mimic the presence of this filament by decreasing the diffusion coefficient. But since, since they are cylinders well in reality they're not cylinders but it's the there, there should be vertical structures we made the hypothesis that they don't affect oh i have something in the chat free to post your question on the chat during the talk we will address them at the end of the talk okay so i should not have read this sorry so since there are vertical structure we say it doesn't affect the diffusion in the z axis, but the, it, it should affect the diffusion in the xy plane. So we introduce an anisotropy coefficient. So zero means that the, the transsynaptic filament have no impact on diffusion. And one would be that. Uh, the, the synapse is so crowded by synaptic filaments that the diffusion in the XY plane will stop uh, altogether. So this is a, a bit a, a, a bit of a schematic of how our, uh, of what our model look like, looks like. In the yellow zone, it's the zone in which we have um, we assume that we have a transsynaptic filament and that the diffusion of receptor is slowed by these filaments. So what to include in, in our model? So we want to model the diffusion of neurotransmitters. We want to describe the, the response of the postsynaptic channel. We also want to model the electric field. I, I'm going to go back to that later. And this idea, honestly, it came from uh, two reviewers. They asked to include the lateral diffusion of receptors because, as you probably know, neurotransmitter diffuse, but receptors will also diffuse within the membrane. And what we did, did not uh, do in this particular model is to uh, and the fluctuation in ion, of ionic concentration, which I would like to do in future work. So a bit of um, a, a bit of a words um, will discuss. Well, sorry, will discuss briefly all of these points. So when you want to model 
the diffusion of neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft, what is often done is that one can use a continuous approach. You can assume that the concentration of neurotransmitter is a continuous function. This has been done in the Savchenko and Rusakov paper that I talked uh, about earlier. And you get, if you assume that you have a radial symmetry and that the synapse is infin infinite, you get a nice analytical solution that you obtain by solving this um, partial differential equation. And if you assume that the synapse is not infinite, but it's only a, a finite domain with boundary condition, you get something that's a little bit more uh, complicated, but that still can be solved quite e easily. We rather opted for the, the following, uh, that was also done by Ventriglia, is that we model the movement of each neurotransmitter by a Brownian motion. It's a little bit uh, more computationally expensive because you have to track the position of each neurotransmitter at each time step. And then you, uh, at each time step, basically you, you draw a random di direction and you, you let the, the, the system evolve. I won't, uh, I won't uh, teach you what a Brownian motion is, but we get some kind of a random movement of each neurotransmitters. And we asked, we wanted to ask the question, does it make any difference? Is it worth it to um, model the displacement of individual uh, neurotransmitters or is it enough to use um, continuous concentration approximation? So to tackle this question, we did the following. We tracked how many times or what was the proportion of neurotransmitters that were captured by receptors? Because one argument is that if the Let's give some, some orders of magnitude. Say there are, um, say there are 20,000 neurotransmitters and 50 receptors. So most neurotransmitters will never be captured by receptors. So the fact that they are captured and released, it will have no impact on, on the computations. But what we showed is that if you have only a small number of neuro, neurotransmitters, say 1,000, then 13% of the neurotransmitters will get uh, captured at least one once by receptors. And like 2% of the neurotransmitters will get captured at least twice by receptors. So when you have a small number of uh, neurotransmitters, it may be worth uh, computing the displacement of each neurotransmitters individually because the fact that they are captured and released by receptors, it will have um, not a large but a significant impact on the concentration and on the number of um, receptors in the cleft. You cannot neglect completely, you cannot completely neglect this. So that's what we wanted to do. And of course, the other thing that we want to model when we describe uh, synaptic responses is the, um, is the response of channels. So this is the, 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 the simple model that we use. Uh, C means that the channel is in a closed state. When it captures a, a neurotransmitter, it can move to C0, for example, which is closed without any bound transmitters to C1, to C2, and then it opens. And this is a question that I'm going to ask you if anybody, anybody knows. One thing that always strikes me is that when you look in the literature to try to understand what should be the schematic that you use to model a channel opening? 
you always get a lot of possibilities and it's never quite clear to me uh, which, which uh, transition scheme we should use and what impact does it have? So we opted for um, something that we, we found, I, I, sorry, I did not give the, the reference already, but uh, that's something that we found in the literature for a relatively simple scheme. And one thing that we did, I'm not sure how interesting it's for you, but I wanted to see how many transition occur typically between channel states. And here we, we, we color coded the, the, num the typical number of transitions between each state. And what we see, uh, don't, don't mind, the, 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 we did it in several conditions, but what we see is that the most frequent trans transitions are between the the state close uh, close with uh, zero transmitters attached and closed with one transmitters attached. Uh, so th those are the most uh, frequent transition. And we see that uh, here it's all the desensitized states. So the transition between two different uh, desensitized states or the transition here that involve uh, desensitization, it almost never occurs. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to model, which is not uh, always done, is the electric field within the synapse. And when I talk about that, many people understand the electric potential of the, or the, the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron. Because when you me measure an uh, APSP, uh, um, when you measure synaptic response, you, you, you measure the postsynaptic neuron usually, but that's not what I mean. When you have a synaptic current, you, you, you need to have current that comes from outside the synapse to the center of the synapse, and then you have a current. But if you want, the, your current to come from outside outside the synapse to the center of the synapse, you need to have a, um, a gradient in uh, electric potential here. You need to have a gradient in electric potential within the synaptic cleft. And that's what we computed with the finite, uh, finite volume approach. And we got results that were kind of similar as what uh, Rusakov and Savchenko got, that dur during a synaptic event, you can get, uh, because we modeled uh, excitatory, uh, we modeled uh, excitatory events, so we, 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 kind of, we can get a depolarization of the, we can, we can have a depolarization of, uh, so, sorry, I say depolarization, I say it in reverse. We can have a hyperpolarization that occurs at the center of the synapse. So the center of the synapse will be, let's say at minus five or minus 10 millivolt when compared to the, the side of the synapse. And this will be, uh, this will have um, an impact, this will have an impact on the synaptic current this is quite tough, I was told, to measure or to verify experimentally because this kind of a change in potential don't last long and it will not be clear how to measure it. But theoretically, if you have a current at the center of the synapse, then it should translate into a small um, change of potential. We also wanted to model the lateral diffusion of receptors. And one reason, uh, there's one reason why lateral diffusion of receptors are, is important. Well, there are probably many, but one reason is that if you have a um, diffusion of, um, if you have no diffusion of receptors, if the receptors always stay at the same at the same location and you have repeated stimulation and the repeated stimulation is at high enough frequency, 
your receptors will get at the desensitized states. Th that's what you see on the left. But then what you see on the right is that if the receptor move, even if you have the, a repeated stimulation, the receptors that are desensitized, that are right under the synapse and well, right under the vesicle that are desensitized, they will be replaced by kind of new receptors. So that's something we wanted to include in the model. One thing that we neglected in this work is the um, response in uh, ionic concentration. This is just to show that it can be done in, under context, in other contexts. This is a, a work by a recently graduated PhD, Frank Boan, who did it in, um, to model the calcium in uh, dendritic spines. So that's, uh, that was a bit of, um, uh, well, that was the, the description of how we build our model to analyze the um, activity of, um, no, so sorry, that, that was a description of the model that we built to analyze the impact of nanocolons on synaptic transmission. And the question that we wanted to ask is what is the impact of nanocolon on synaptic current? And the two first hypotheses that we had beginning the, the project, the, the, the a priori that we had, is that nanocolons, since they align docking vesicles and post-synaptic receptors, they should, in principle, have a, an effect to increase the current amplitude. Also, since the, again, since they align uh, physical docking site and receptors, it should decrease the, 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 the rise time because the neurotransmitter should take less time to reach the receptors. So that was our initial guess. But what we found is that the, the, the simulation results were, were not that spectacular because the nanocolon could um, cause an increase in current amplitude in small synapses. So when you have only a small number of neurotransmitters, yes, the nanocolon should increase the current amplitude. But when you have a large number of neurotransmitters, then the nanocolon has potentially almost no effect. Why? Because when you have enough neurotransmitters, all the, 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 all the channels or all the receptors will become eventually open anyway. So it seems, but it's very just a simulation for the moment, that nanocolon should could play a role in reinforcing weak synapses. And they can lead to uh, saturation and to the fact that receptors will become desensitized. Because as I told you, when you have lateral diffusion of receptors, it prevents the, 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 the receptors from going into the desensitized state. But when you have nanocolon, it's not um, it's not as important, and the 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 receptor seems to seem to go into uh, desensitized states anyway. And this is the kind of, of results that we got. We tried different configuration. Let's say uh, with half of the receptors inside the nanocolon here and half outside all outside or all inside. And if we change the uh, uh, anisotropy coefficient, meaning that if we consider here, when, when, uh, when it's uh, 0 0.9, it means that the synapse is really crowded by transsynaptic filament. So when you have only a few neurotransmitters, you can, you can consider this as the effect of the nanocolon. So the nanocolon has an important effect on the current, uh, on the peak current, but when you have a large number of uh, neurotransmitters, this effect becomes uh, very, very small. So that's the kind of 
results that we got. And I'm not sure how is it with time, but anyway, I'm to I'm nearing the the I'm at the end of my of my talk. What we would like to do in the future is that we would like to use the the um, this formalism to investigate other uh, synaptic types. W what I want to do next uh, with respect to that is to model a dual synapse, a synapse that will contain both GABA and glycine receptors and uh, with vesicle that will release both uh, GABA and glycine ne neurotransmitters. There's a lot of um, questions related to those synapses. We will also, well, that's longer term, but incorporate all this in a model of uh, synaptic potentiation to see if, um, if nanocolons and if you, how, how, how nanocolons could, could play a role in synaptic potentiation, we would, uh, I would like to include fluctuation in ionic concentration um, in, in these kinds of models. And I would like also to build larger models, uh, by larger I mean with a larger domain to include the space that surrounds the SNAPs with possibly uh, glial cells that absorb the, the spillovers of um, neurotransmitters. So I want to uh, thank uh, Antoine Godin with who uh, I, I did this work, Xiaoting and uh, Gabriel Lemont. I, will, I also want to, to thank NSERC and the Servo, and I want to thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Nicola. That was pretty timely. So actually, very, <laughs> very interesting subject that I personally wasn't aware of this topic of uh, synaptic now columns. So, so I, I have some questions. But first, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, the audience uh, if uh, anyone would like to to just uh, ask questions. So I see Francis uh, that. Uh, uh, is raising the hand. Uh, let's see if there is somebody else in the meantime. Okay, Francis, why, why don't you just start? Okay, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, very interesting. And um, I, in particular, well, many things, but I mean, one of the <laughs> things you touched on very nicely is sort of that discrete versus the continuous aspect to just see it sort of in, in, in the flesh, so to speak, about where that makes a difference is. But I just wanted to ask sort of in general, you referred to that earlier paper where they had, um, I forget the author, I think it was single author where they had the filaments and you said you didn't include that, but then you were talked about these different aspects. Yeah. So I guess what is the difference in terms of what they got versus you or is that, can, can well, we talk about okay, it that way? Okay, okay. Well, that, there's two, maybe, okay, I should have make a distinction be between there's two things. One can consider the neurotransmitters as a continuous or an individual. Mm -hmm. we, we both did consider, Vatriglia and us, we both did consider them as individual uh, particles. But what they did that we did not do is that they considered the, the transleptic filaments as individual cylinders. Okay, so that so presumably that means their computation was a lot more complicated to kind of like yeah. more computational intensive. Yeah, and, so and, and, and that 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 trade off this allowed us to test uh, more, more much more scenarios yeah. than than they did. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and, yeah. and, and the, what what the, 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 there's that, but yeah, I, I really. Respect that the but that he he succeeded in implementing this, but the, the other question is the fact that the um, transleptic filaments are regularly spaced on the grid is kind of maybe, mm. but yeah maybe not yeah. also yeah it, it's yeah. quite a, be, be, because if if you pl place them individually you kind of you have to settle for. Um, 
may be relatively arbitrary uh, distribution. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. No, no, I mean, it's always sort of this this balance of, of where to put the sort of the complexity. So it was nice that you were sort of able to examine whether certain things make yeah. a difference or not. And especially, I mean, of course, Marisa does GLIA stuff. So, you know, and there's sort of lots of details associated there. So what matters is what's yeah. there. Okay, all right. Okay, so you, basically, um, the, yeah. the, they put it in uniformly space. So, you know, they can't sort of answer the same questions that you yeah. did because of that. Yeah, okay. Because okay. Th there's work that, that show that uh, theoretical work that, that, that shows that if you have diffusion of particles with, with regular space like uh, obstacles, it, 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 you can uh, relate the fraction of uh, the space that is filled to reduction in effective diffusion coefficient. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Hi, Steve. Hi, um, and so I'm gonna follow up on that sort of question with respect to the obstacles because the obstacles have an orientation, yeah. right? And so in, in modeling sort of this change in diffusion coefficient, I was wondering if you considered, you know, there's some sort of anisotropy, you know, so that this is re restricting lateral diffusion, but yeah. but not necessarily diffusion across the cleft. So is that That's factored in or maybe I missed? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. We assume that they are like perfect, perfectly uh, vertical. So, so no, no effect on, on well, vertical doesn't mean anything, but, but no, I assume that the Z axis is uh, across the snaps and the X, Y plane is, um, is lateral. So we assume that it had no, that, that the same thing that, that as what was obtained by Vatriglia. If it's uh, vertical cylinders, it has no effect on the diffusion in the z-axis, but it slows the the. Okay, so the, so the value, the diffusion coefficient is different in these different yeah. dimensions. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's why we use the um, anisotropy coefficient notation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thanks a lot. Any further question? Uh, so I, 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 I invite the audience to please ask questions. Meantime, I'll ask uh, um, a couple of questions, or at least I start with one. So Nicola, I was very intrigued by uh, this idea of that you mentioned of the fluctuations in ion concentrations that you said you don't consider right now in the model uh, actual yeah. fluctuations. But I was wondering, uh, so in some way you could think still that you account for fluctuations that are uh, derived from the fact that your receptors are actually diffusing yeah. in the membrane so so my question goes uh, i think starts uh, in this direction so what is uh in terms of uh, impact on the optimality, for example, uh, suggested by uh, part of your work and, uh, and Dmitry Rusikov as well. Uh, what is the effect of these uh, diffusion, lateral diffusion of receptors, as well as once you would think about uh, uh, glial processes, you have lateral diffusion of transporters on yeah. the actual transmission of the synapse? I mean, yeah, okay. you have some strong noise over there, right? That yeah, that yeah, goes yeah, on. Yeah. So, what what would be the reason for, or like how the the system, the nano column system, actually mitigate for such a inner and stochasticity? Yeah, um, well, I, I'm I'm not sure that I will answer your your question uh, correctly. But first, lateral diffusion. Maybe there's a, an optimality argument to be made because. First, if you have no lateral diffusion, you will get desensitized very fast when you have uh, repeated stimulation. But if you have too much lateral diffusion, then it's impossible to align the, 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 the receptors to the to the, the to the physical. So, so there, there, there should be a trade-off maybe between um there's there, there, maybe there is a trade-off between preventing desensitization and being a, able to align receptors to to um 
to, to the king sites. And then you, you asked uh, how the Nanook, well, Nanook alums, maybe the, 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 the one hypothesis is that there are like uh, proteins in the, uh, that go across the synapse and that anchor receptors and prevent diffusion. So the, the, the net effect of this should be mitigated because it, 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 uh, when, when it doesn't move, then you, you have larger current if you have just one, one release. But if you have repeated release, then you, you, you get desensitized quite fast. Thanks. And I guess a follow up question was thinking about again. So we have these, um, I'm thinking about the inhibitory synapses, right? But uh, so these nano columns here, uh, just yeah. in terms of, of understanding, are like unspecific in terms of type of synapses or are actually synapses mostly of one type? And within this framework, thinking about nano columns of inhibitory synapses, right? I would assume that as chloride enters, you also have a flux of bicarbonate. So these <laughs> two quantities, right, uh, uh, modifies locally uh, the, I would say, electro uh, osmosis or whatever, and they have uh, variations on the volume. Is there any any assessment of actually how the nano volume of this column varies with the activity. Okay, first, I, I don't want to say uh, anything stupid. So I, I the nanocolons, I, as far as I know, they have been observed in excited, excitatory synapses, and I'm not sure if they exist in um, GABA glycine synapses. But I, I want to model th those synapses, but I'm not sure if nanocolons will be relevant. Then, what you you're saying about the the non, the kind of um, that uh, if you have an influx of chloride, you, you will have bicarbonate, and then it will uh, involve. Um, I'm not sure if it's how how you meant it, but it will involve water fluxes and change of volume. This is something that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I should say that it keeps me awake at night, but uh, if I had an idea of how to do it, it would be uh, wonderful. But it's a, it's a great, great question, a great question, which I don't have any um, idea how to tackle because there's a, the, w w when you involve, uh, change of volume, I, my guess is that you also have to account for the, the kind of mechanical stability of the membrane, but then it, it, we need, we need, <laughs> we need your, your, your ideas. Well, I, I'm glad I, I just reminded you one of the reasons you might be staying up during the night. So yeah, uh, I have a, I read here a question from uh, the chat. Uh, uh, before reading, I'm asking Alex if he wants to just ask it, but uh, you can read it as well in uh, in the chat. So Alex, if you are there, uh, feel free to step in and uh, and just uh, interact uh, live. Sure. Thank you for the Hi. talk. Thanks. I just wanted to ask, it's, it's a bit of a naive question, but uh, since I'm working on alpha-5 type projects, and now I'm thinking more about like how much the kinetics and voltage and ion concentration dependencies matter. Uh, in the context of nanocolumns, especially when you think about different alpha subunits, like alpha-5 that's located more mm -hmm. extrasynaptically uh, and tonic inhibition, yeah, you know but how much those things, those like uh, channel compositions, matter. Yes. Uh, 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 how you're going to generate these results? Question. You you should talk to Eve Eve the mm -hmm. He has done a, 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 a lot of things on that, and th th that I, I'm not sure if nanocolons will be involved, but that that's definitely something we 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 would like to do, uh, 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 because 
it, it shows that um, subtypes like alpha one to alpha six they change in in, um, in neuropathic pain or at least in models of PNI. Mm -hmm. the, the, and this is something that I would like to do to build a model with um, both the um, extrasynaptic and synaptic receptors with distribution of some of, of subtypes, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I will not know. It's a good, so it's something that should be important, but it's not, I yeah. don't understand it yet. Uh, with all the combinations, it gets complicated yeah. pretty quickly. But, but, but we need to do it because it's, uh, it's relevant. Definitely. Yeah, because extra synaptic should be like more like a baseline ton tonic inhibition, and yeah. synaptic should be like sharp and, and transmit some uh, temporal relevant information. But that's the intuition. But how to formalize it, it's not clear. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Any further question? Yeah. Yeah, I have uh, uh, just yeah, uh, uh, another, yeah, yeah. I mean, because I've been familiar with work from Milad's lab, I was, you know, and you mentioned desensitization, so like short-term plasticity, essentially. Yeah. So, like, so I think if I followed correctly, that a lot of like this issues you look like it does affect, right? Like in terms of the the yeah. lateral distribution, right? So, you know, um, I mean, Milad or, or people in his his lab could speak to this a little bit more <laughs> with a more specific question, but. Would you would it be fair to say that these kind of effects could be significant in like you know um, deep brain stimulation type paradigms because you know that's sort of at the synapse there right and so if you have sort of you know this is you know it sort of matters in terms of how much uh, depression like short term plasticity effects like I mean this is a more or oh, there's Milad he could fill it in but when I was listening to you that sort of came to my mind right because you're mm -hmm. talking about this movement so is that something you could imagine trying to understand whether that's you know because you sort of say does this matter right when you're doing this yeah. model yeah but but that that's a, a a good question but i'm not sure how to uh i, I i'm really not sure be, but because for the brain simulation you you mean the the uh, um, the implementation of an electrode and and then you you yeah, so it's sort of more like, does it matter, right? Like these nano columns, right? To include in, in the model? I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure in the context of the brain simulation. I, I, I will not know. No, <laughs> I will not know what to say. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, I'll let Mila talk, but I mean, they recently I mean, showed actually, up. Yeah. Thanks just for raising this. I wanted to ask this, but uh, I was not sure whether it is uh, maybe re related. But very briefly, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you, uh, or the way that you can consider about the impact of deep brain stimulation is that, for example, in the context of this electric field that you talk about around this, uh, you know, yeah. nanocolumn, and you mentioned this five millivolt or difference is, is yeah. important. When we have DBS, you can consider something like electrical stimulation, very close to uh, the neuron or synaptic cleft, yeah. right? And then when you have the pulse, although it is charge balanced at the end, for example, if you consider one pulse, it is a charge balanced pulse, but it's like a bombardment of electric fields around the neuron. Now, we really don't know the exact effect, but many people think that it can activate these presynaptic neurons so that they fire somehow in uh, agreement with the with the frequency of these pulses. Now, one thing oh. that for me, it was kind of question is that if you have this kind of electric field, a huge electric field around the synaptic cleft, how do you think that this can affect, I mean, with respect to electric field? And I mean, the second probably follow-up question would be in, in your, modeling you mentioned about this presynaptic and postsynaptic stuff or uh, receptors but then how and you also showed this synaptic currents that I, I i could imagine that you meant by synaptic currents so that it can activate or it can create action potential so does the firing rate of the presynaptic input 
also important. For example, if it goes like 200 hertz, for example. Yeah, if it goes to 200 hertz, you, you'll have a lot of, well, you, you'll have several effects. So I, I'm, I'm gonna not really answer the question, but we, 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 like they say in jazz, we need a bigger boat. We, we need a we need another model to 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 account to uh, to account for the brain simulation. You, you, you we we will have definitely we will definitely need to have a larger scale model with uh, maybe yeah. uh, one cu one cubic millimeter of of brain tissues and yeah we, we will need to be because if you have some things like uh, 200 hertz of, of firing, you will have many things that will occur. You will have uh, maybe depletion of, uh, yep. of a presynaptic vesicle. You will have desensitization. So there will be many things. So I, I really think if we want, to, well, th that's my guess. If we would like, if we would want to understand better the brain simulation, we would have to build the geometric, geometrically realistic model of at least. Uh, yep. A few few thousand neurons and, and things like that and 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 I'm not able to do that for the moment. So, so sorry, I'm not very useful, but it's uh... no, sure. And then what I mean, just one quick point. So, how do you think that uh, if you have, for example, some abnormal electric field? I mean, huge electric yeah. field around the synaptic cleft. If it is, for example, significantly bigger than that five volt that you showed, how that affect the whole transmission and the diffusion? I, I would guess it will change everything. So, so the, the, the effects will be quite large, and we have to to go back to the the, the drawing board. Right, but then it, would it be kind of increase of synaptic transmission or it can just they can we don't know I, I, I would say it could bo go both ways depend on the orientation of the field and things like that okay yeah so Thanks. it's uh, it, yeah but it's uh i i, I know someone uh do you know charlie fecto mm, no no, no she, she 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 doesn't work on deep brain stimulation but she worked on non-invasive non stimulation. Okay. Yeah. And what she finds is not only her, but that, that, that it has an effect on uh, many, many things, many disease, but we, we're not able to relate it to a mechanical model of, of neurons active. The only thing we can do is to relate the stimulation to the distribution of the electric field in the brain. So may, same thing when you do uh, the brain stimulation, you say you put the electron there, you, you know how you have an idea of what volume, of what is the volume that you stimulate, but to relate that to a mechanistic things, not yet. Yep, yeah, yeah, gotcha, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, any further questions? No? So, we do have still a few minutes, so so five minutes, 10 minutes, so please feel free to ask. So, <laughs> Yeah, I know it's always intimidating when you when you probably speak about uh, these uh, relatively complex models about synapses. But I saw uh, also the idea of going towards uh, plasticity there. Yeah. So, what kind of plasticity actually? Well, 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 well. Um, there's a well. The, the way I understand that, if you want to go to plasticity, you, you need to uh, include, um, first thing to include is calcium. <laughs> then you include um, intracellular signaling with uh, some calcium reactions. And then it has, you can have an impact on, um, because now, now you have lateral diffusion of receptors, but you also sh should include internalization and externalization of receptors. And then you, you can build a, 
you can build a, a, a model like that that will be a little bit more complex, but you, basically I think you, you include calcium, you include calcium reactions and the, the effect on, on uh, receptor fixation, internalization and things like that. Yeah, it, it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge to include uh, uh, to include calcium uh, inside uh, inside the system because, oh man. Well, yeah, but what, what, what one one main ch challenge is the 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 number of reactions because uh, yeah. It, yeah. And, and another thing is that when you want to include reaction in your model, it's a bit tricky uh, on the computer computational side because you have things that work. Uh, it's the same uh, you talked about uh, bicarbonate. It's the same thing. Is that you 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 now deal with uh, chemical reactions which are very, very fast. So it's right, yeah. a bit of trick. But it's worse, when you talked about bicarbonate, it's worse with the um, pH. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, which is, also, it, which is yeah. also, which also keeps me up during the night, I guess. So. Yeah. P yeah, pH is worse than calcium because it's, <sighs> you, you get uh, so much, uh, so many reactions and so many transporters. And, and then you have the task of saying, I cannot include everything because everything is too 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 much. So uh, um, I have a one conclusive questions because so so how these nano columns uh, for yeah. actually relate to to uh, neuropathic pain? What 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 would be? The framework uh, or the link. Well, with, uh... Uh, maybe, maybe we will not put uh, nano columns, but we, 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 what what I mean, we can use the 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 the, the, the framework that we 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 did uh, that we have a receptor with lateral diffusion. We have we compute the electrical field within the synapse. We compute the, the stochastic diffusion of uh, neurotransmitters, as you as Mister. Um, uh, Alexander said, "We can we could use different types of uh, of receptors uh, extrasynaptically and synaptically, and then we can we can run it. But it's not nanocolons per se. But I'm the the what I meant is that one next step that we want to try is to use the the, the our model framework to yes. to get back like synapses." Yeah, thanks. So, if uh, there are no further questions, let me see if anyone, because usually the audience is always very shy, right? So even I even ask, if uh, uh, here I can is ask Alex, a quick general yeah, please, question. Ahead, so, kind of going in the other direction of what Maurizio was asking, if you look at microcircuit models that yeah. are out there. What advice would you have for inclusion in synaptic models that you don't typically see in microcircuit? Well, my, what, what, what features of synapses would you like to see included in like microcircuit models, larger scale microcircuit models where it's a little more uh, computationally yeah. restrictive? Um, by microcircuit, how, how, how large do you... I I just uh, it's a whole different scale, so it doesn't really matter. It's more like an aspirational question of like, you yeah, see but... a lot of features in these complex synapse models, yeah, and you see no features, and it's very it's, we it's a lot simpler. I I think what what has to be included in micro circuit model, but it's uh, just a per personal guess is different time scales. Because snaps will have uh, slow, there will be slow change in the ionic concentration, uh, slow change in the maybe receptor configuration. So, so you, I think, it, it, at uh, 
if you only consider short time scale, any 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 simple model will be fine. But what I would like to to see is sl slow adaptation mechanisms, like on the order of uh, GABA B. Um, slow uh, on the order of seconds or things like that. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I guess we are we can conclude and uh, and uh, then move on. So, uh, Francis, would you like to say anything? Uh, otherwise, I would like to thank everyone for uh, for attending this uh, beautiful talk by Nicola. I would like to thank our speaker and uh, again for for attending uh, our seminar it's a little bit early in the morning so 9 30 so it might be a bit of a rough uh, wake up and uh, and uh, without any further ado like again to thank everyone and merry christmas happy yeah. holiday season stay warm uh which is not <laughs> difficult even the location here <laughs> and uh uh, I guess uh, we will see each other uh, uh, in a month or or at the next uh, uh, seminar. Please uh, just to check uh, our uh, website, kcnhub.com. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nicola. Bye. Thank you, Nicola. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.